So welcome to this mentoring moment. We're gonna be talking about creativity in the kingdom. Kingdom writers, are you ready to unleash your creative creativity into the world <laughs> through your writing and other means? If so, let's do this. My name is Shelly Hitz. And I'm CJ Hitz. Good to be with you again. Yes, we are your author, coaches, and mentors inside Christian Book Academy. And it's amazing to, to me that we have been mentoring writers for over a decade now. And um, I'm getting ready to press publish on the 68th book between the two of us. So <laughs> crazy, right? But um, today, CJ is going to... Um, spend a few minutes just encouraging you with this theme of creativity in the kingdom and about worshiping God through our writing. Yeah. So why don't we just uh, start with a word of prayer? Just yeah. ask the Lord to really do what he wants here. So Father, we just thank you so much for your word that we're going to look into. We thank you, Lord, that you do have a plan and purpose for each of us as kingdom writers. And uh, I want to pray that we would uh, not only worship you in our writing, but really glorify and magnify you uh, to all those that, that read our books and our writings. We just pray that uh, people would be drawn to the beauty of Christ through our writings. And we thank you for each one here. Uh, thank you for those that are live, those that are listening to the recording, and we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would uh, would have your way today as we uh, we look into your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And all the kingdom writers said, <laughs> Amen. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at uh, some words from 1 Kings. Back in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 7, verses 13 through 22. And then jumping down just for a quick six verses, 40 to 45. So if you want to open your Bibles, uh, you can do that or pull it up on your phone like I have. And uh, join me with 1 Kings chapter 7. So listen to this, these words. And this is, just to put it in context, this is, they're in the process of building this uh, grand temple that Solomon has been uh, uh, commission to build. And uh, so listen to this as we pick up in verse 13 of chapter 7, 1 Kings. It says, King Solomon then asked for a man named Huram to come from Tyre. He was half Israelite since his mother was a widow from the tribe of Nap Naphtali and his father had been a craftsman in bronze from Tyre. Huram was extremely skillful and talented in any work in bronze, and he came to do all the metalwork for King Solomon. So Huram cast two bronze pillars, each 27 feet tall and 18 feet in circumference. For the tops of the pillars, he cast bronze capitals, each 7.5 feet tall, each capital was decorated with seven sets of latticework and interwoven chains. He also encircled the latticework with two rows of pomegranates to decorate the capitals over the pillars. Now the capitals on the columns inside the entry room were shaped like water lilies and they were six feet tall. The capitals on the two pillars had, get this now, 200 pomegranates in two rows around them beside the rounded surface next to the latticework. Huram set the pillars at the entrance of the temple, one toward the south and one toward the north, and he named the one on the south Jachin and the one to the north Boaz. The capitals on the pillars were shaped like water lilies, and so the work on the pillars was finished. Now let's jump down to verse 40. And this is going to give a little summary of the things that 
uh, this Huram fella who was extremely talented in what he was working on as a craftsman. It's a little summary of what he basically did. So he also made the necessary wash basins, shovels, and bowls. So at last, Huram completed everything King Solomon had assigned him to make for the temple of the Lord. And what are those things? Verse 41, the two pillars, the two bowl-shaped capitals on the tops of the pillars, the two networks of interwoven chains that decorated the capitals. For, verse 42, the 400 pomegranates that hung from the chains on the capitals, two rows of pomegranates for each of the chain networks that decorated the capitals on the tops of the pillars, the ten water carts holding the ten basins, the sea, and the twelve oxen under it, and the ash buckets, the shovels, and the bowls. Hiram made all these things of burnished bronze for the temple of the Lord, just as King Solomon had directed. And so, as I'm looking at this guy, um, reading, you know, all of his intricacies, the detail of the work, I can't help but think of us as artists, us as craftsmen in our writing. And it says here that this man, Hiram, was extremely skillful and talented. Again, his mother was Jewish, so she's from the tribe of Naphtali. So he had that aspect of his heritage. He was taught the things of God. He was, you better believe his mom was teaching him the <laughs> Word of God and teaching him everything regarding uh, the Lord. How proud must she have been that her son was going to be working on this grand temple uh, that was going to be built, that, that, that King Solomon was commissioned. His father had the vision, David, but Solomon was the one that was able to com complete that temple. And then it says his dad was a Gentile from, from Tyre. Now, Tyre is uh, a region in Lebanon today. And so um, it was known that there were, there were skilled craftsmen in bronze uh, in that area. And so after reading about the precision and detail of Hiram's work, we see that this is a guy who glorified and worshipped God through his skills. There was thought, purpose, and intentionality in his work. Now, how do we know that there was intentionality? Well, right away we see that he actually named these two 27-foot tall pillars. And what did he name them? Well, he named one of them Jachin. Jachin actually means he establishes. Mm -hmm. And Boaz means in him is strength. Imagine all the worshipers who are going to journey to this magnificent temple, which stood, get this now, it stood for over 400 years before it was destroyed, before uh, the Israelites would be carried off into the Babylonian exile. And so Hiram essentially was being intentional in that he wanted each of these worshipers, as well as all the kings that would come after Solomon, to be reminded of the fact that God alone establishes our ways and upholds us in his strength. Upon entering the temple, they were set in the right frame of mind to worship the Lord. These two pillars, these magnificent pillars that we read in detail, were an invitation to, quote, come and get established. To come here and receive the strength of God. And you know, as believers in Christ, we can also say that we've actually been established in a right relationship with God, and we're also given strength to endure to the end. But as kingdom writers, as kingdom writers, endeavoring to glorify the Lord, endeavoring to worship the Lord through our writing, we've been given the wonderful privilege of being established by God in our calling to write words 
that will outlive us. Amen. And to actually uh, receive the strength to endure as long as God has us here on this planet. Mm -hmm. And we all know that there's difficulties. We all know that getting those books published is not an easy thing. We're going to face resistance. We're going to face difficulties. And yet the Lord wants to give us strength. He wants to establish us. It's like these two pillars that stood as a reminder at the very front of the entrance of the temple. Mm. And just as Hiram was hired and appointed to furnish and magnify the beauty of Solomon's temple, we as kingdom writers are called to glorify and magnify the beauty of Christ Amen. in our writings. Our writings can help display a God that's more than worthy to be worshipped. Now, I think it's also good that we remember that these two pillars, I want you just to imagine this, these two pillars were nearly 30 feet high. Now, a standard basketball hoop <laughs> in a gym, those of you that have played basketball, you know that it's 10 feet high. Now, I just want you to imagine three times that now. Now, Michael Jordan's not going to be able to dunk on a 30 foot high. So you're rim. talking about the actual rim is 10 feet high? The rim in a, on a standard okay. basketball hoop in a gym is 10 feet high. These pillars were nearly 30 feet Three times. high. And so <clears throat> I want you just imagine these pillars and they're nearly 30 feet in height. Now I don't know about you but as I'm just imagining worshipers coming to the temple and bringing their offerings, I imagine not everyone's going to actually notice the 200 pomegranates <laughs> that this Hiram put on each of these pillars. Now each, now there's 400 total fashioned out of bronze. Wow. And you can just imagine the detail in these pomegranates. I imagine not everybody's going to notice those. They're going to walk through Everyone's eyes aren't aren't naturally going to go to the 30-foot level as they're walking in and like, oh, wow, look at those pomegranates up there. Yeah. Now, a lot of people would notice. There's going to be people that are, are lended toward that, that eye for art, that eye for detail. Right. But a total of 400 pomegranates handmade out of bronze. But I want to tell you who did notice. Who noticed? God noticed. Right. God noticed those pomegranates. Every single one of those 400 pomegranates that Hiram labored over. I imagine just each one was a labor unto itself. Just the detail there and the lattice work. You and I have no idea who's going to walk through the front doors of our books. Many of those readers may not even notice the painstaking detail mm -hmm. that each of us are putting into these books, the effort yeah. that we've put into them, the blood, sweat, and tears, the agony, <laughs> the prayer, just asking the Lord for clarity, asking Him to overcome our writer's block. But you and I can rest assured that God notices. Amen. And our books and writings are one of the primary ways that we've been called to worship and glorify our great King. We have a privilege here of offering our worship to the Lord through these books. And this is why we refer to ourselves as kingdom writers. We are priestly pens, as we say, in the hands of the author of life. You and I have a grand opportunity not only to worship the Lord ourselves through our gifts that he's given us in writing, but we have an opportunity to help lead others through the, the front doors of these books and into the grand halls that the Lord wants us to lead worshipers into. And so I want to just encourage you that just like Hiram, who it says was extremely talented and skillful. You and I, in our own ways, are extremely skilled and talented based on what God's given us. He's given us gifts in writing, 
and numerous other things. I mean, many of you have many gifts. And I just want to say that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, <clears throat> magnify the Lord through those gifts and to worship. This is our form of worship that we offer in our lives today. And uh, the Lord wants to use us. Mm -hmm. He wants us to uh, write words that outlive us. And uh, we're in some interesting days, and I'm probably going to be talking more about that even in, in uh, future videos, but we are living in what I believe are the last days. I believe with all my heart that uh, there should be an urgency in each one of us to share in our writings gospel messages that the Lord allows us to tuck in there, um, to to uh, write beautiful words about who this Jesus is and what he's done for us and to point people toward salvation in Christ. We have that grand opportunity <clears throat> to help lead people to their creator and allow them to enter into a right, a right relationship again, to have their sins forgiven, to know that when they take that last breath, they're with the Lord. And um, so I want to encourage you there. This is our form of worship. This is the way that we as a people in the kingdom of God have been commissioned. Just like Hiram was commissioned to display his art and his craftsmanship, you and I are called to display our writings for a watching world that's hungry and looking for words of life. And so, uh, Shelley, I don't know if you want to uh, at least pray for us, and, uh, yeah. and then we'll just move on to the next section here. Yeah, so I often say um, door or books are door openers, you know, um, like these, you know, these pillars were the entrance, the welcoming, but our books can be door openers for people. And it was the way that our housekeeper came to salvation in Christ was mm. just giving her a couple of our books and it started a conversation. And so your books, God has, um, you know, purposes for them beyond what you can see. And he sees all the painstakingly, you know, <laughs> details that are going into, you know, your, your writing, your editing, your researching, all of the steps of publishing and marketing. And so he sees you, he yeah. sees you kingdom writers don't give up and keep going. The enemy wants to shut you down, but God is cheering you on and we are too. So Lord, we just thank you today that you are the author of life, that we are the priestly pens in your hands and that we can be your messengers and our books can be conduits of your message. And so we just pray. I pray for each person listening right now. I pray for courage to rise up. I pray for um, your spirit to just flow into them. Lord, I just pray that they would continue the work that you've called them to do, that their messages would impact many lives. And Lord, that we would be careful to give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise for what you do through our books. And we just pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.